Welcome back to Play Tessie. It is episode 40, the Jaron Duran episode. He wore number 40, not not last year, but for a couple years before that, when he first came up, he did it. Benny did it too. There's a couple of those. It's one of those like whatever numbers. Uh, you're, you're a prospect. You come up, you haven't earned your stripes, but so we'll give you number 40. So it's old Jaron. It's the episode of old Jaron. That's what we'll call it. But it's the official podcast of the clearance rack at Bob stores, which is where you can find the Nike fanatics, official MLB jerseys sitting up there. 80% off. That's where they should be. Cause they suck that hard. Just kidding. They're going to be everywhere. And we're all going to have to pay for them if you want them. JK, just go to DH gate. You didn't hear it here. Uh, also known as the official Red Sox podcast of WEI. Uh, before we get into it, just remember, hit that subscribe button. Follow us. I don't know where you're listening. If it's Odyssey app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. If you're watching us on YouTube, we're getting that YouTube going. All these episodes are going on YouTube and it's great. Like growing on there, we're on the WEI page and it's been going really well. So Appreciate you guys listening and watching wherever you're at, but just remember, rate us five stars, hit that subscribe button, helps us out a ton, and you get that notification when episodes drop, which obviously helps you out a ton. But let's backtrack a little bit. Uh, Sammy and Pat are here with me, and we we touched on it a little bit last episode, but it's gotten even more heat since then, and I'm happy about that because it deserves it. These jerseys suck. They're bad, man. They're really, really bad, and I thought it was funny. Uh, there's a photo of Justin Verlander throwing a bullpen going around. You can see the back of his Jersey and everyone's, you know, they're ripping it to shreds. And that sadly might be the best looking new baseball Jersey we've seen. And it still looks terrible. Just a mess. Yeah. Sammy, was it you last episode who said it looks like a Jersey? Yeah. Yeah, it it's, does. It's significantly worse. Like it looks like they took <laughs> like, a third grader's jersey and put it on a grown man's jersey. Like it just looks so disproportionate. They all look like shit. It's like they're trying to hide the name of the player. Like it's so small. Yeah. It's like they want everyone to be anonymous. And it just feels like it, it was so easily avoidable. Like, like what what was just keep it the same. You don't yeah. have to change it. Like I, yeah. I don't even know. Even if you're changing the material, just make it look the same. Just copy it. Yeah, you have the answers to the test. Copy it. So, you know what's going to be really exciting? When they roll out the new City Connects and they look like a, oh, <laughs> like no. a middle school workshop <laughs> made them. Have we discussed the Philly City Connects? Was that, We don't know if that's real or not. I know the leak you're referring to. Has that been confirmed? I don't know. I haven't when seen those it. those get released, we'll talk about that. Because P.U. Those I haven't stop. seen it. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to pull that up. But I want to. Oh, dude, they're bad. They're bad. If it's if they're real, it's kind of one of those like. Let's see if how uh, did this get approved. But then again, if you showed Coops. me the Red Sox, say it again. Coops, Coops, see if you can get that up on the for the YouTube. See if you can get that jersey up so I can so I can see it so the viewers can see it. But go on, Sammy. It's one of those jerseys. Like if you if you were to show me, I would have been like, how did who approved this? How do you how does this get past the finish line? But then at Wait. the same time. I might not be the best person to ask because the first time I saw the Red Sox City Connect, I projectile vomited. I still hate them. I think they suck, but I'm big time in the minority here. So shows what before I we pull Before we pull this up real quick, Gordo, before you see it, what colors are you guessing this jersey is? <laughs> well, and then it, it's certainly not red and white, if that's what you're saying. I don't know. F- fucking purple, purple and green. I don't know. Like, Okay. All right. You're not what that far I don't off. Know. Well, okay. I I just want to. Re- I asked people to. Dis- I posted a picture. It was like of Andrew Bailey's Red Sox jersey. His with the, with the new letters and whatever. I said one word. Give a, give your take on the new Nike Fanatics jerseys. I just want to read a few of them off here. Cheap looks cheap. Horrendous. Cheap garbage. Cheap horrific. Cheap high school garbage. Cheap <laughs> economical. Par for the course with regards to the overall offseason. Uniforms saddening. Ass. <laughs> Yuck. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Cheap. Yikes. Ass cheeks McGee. <laughs> One part, that person was so right. They were like, those are uniforms. Yeah. <laughs> they are uniforms. Nailed it. You're, you're absolutely right. We've got the gif of Elmo shrugging. Like that. <laughs> nah, I mean. Shrinkage. Unnecessary. Shrinkage? Horrible. Oh, Jersey. Fugly. <laughs> So we got some good takes. I, I hope 
I saw somewhere that the that the union approach is approaching Nike or something about it. I have no idea if there's any possible way to backtrack this because I'm sure they've already mass produced them and they're probably all over the place. But who the hell knows? Maybe maybe we can get it fixed for next year. I don't know. <laughs> we love that. We love that as Red Sox fans. That term next year, next year, maybe next year. Yeah, we'll get we'll get fixed jerseys and a fixed team maybe. You're asking a lot, but yeah, I, I figure with this episode that not a lot has happened since last episode. I mean, you're welcome, people. Like we're talking socks for you, and there's not that much to talk about, but we've got plenty to talk about because we can always talk about the socks. Uh, wanted to start off with Fangraphs rankings. They came out with their top hundred prospects, and the Sox had five members on there because they had Miguel Blaze on there, but. The, I, I thought the notable portion of it was that Marcelo Meyer came in at number 69, which is nice, but it's not it's not where you want Meyer to be. I mean, Fangraphs is so weird. Fangraphs is like, it's like the embodiment of the fans who only go by the numbers with no no feel or anything. Like, they, they probably just looked at Meyer's numbers were like, hmm, regression, bad, <laughs> 69th. No context that he was pl- trying to play through like a shoulder injury. No context that he dominated before. Like just, yeah, it's just the <laughs> numbers. Weird thing, the weird thing that I had with that ranking though was I was like, it, so Mayor 69, I was like, all right, that 69, right? Yeah, 69. Okay. Right. Nice. Um, The weird thing with that though was I was like, oh, like obviously they're just going off of like 2023 like season performance. Miguel Blaze didn't play, and he's higher than Marcelo. So I don't know how that works. He was two spots below him, but I see your point. You're right. And he, they, uh, Sadon Rafaela was ahead of Marcelo. But his, but the point yeah. Pat's making is like Marcelo got knocked for playing through a shoulder injury. Blaze doesn't even play. And they're like, nah, you're good, man. You That's chill. True. If, if Meyer didn't play, you have to think he's. If he just shut it down as soon as he hurt his shoulder, you have to think he's probably better on this. Yeah, but I mean, I, I dude, honestly, th- this is really bad radio. What I'm about to say, I just don't give a shit about podcast rank- or podcast rankings, uh, prospect rankings. I just don't care. They're all different. We know that there's certain outlets that will do a little abstract ratings just to get a, you know, a rise out of people. Marcelo Meyer, 69th. Come on, man. What are we doing? It's just I saw that and I kind of like immediately tossed it out and was like, all right, I don't care. This is yeah. a stupid thing. If that's what you think, if that's where you think that guy ranks among the other prospects, if you think there are 68 prospects better than Marcelo Meyer, I don't want to hear it. I, I think I agree with that. And it's also worth noting. I want to say that Jake O'Donnell was the one that pointed this out. But Fangraphs has always been low on Meyer. And like, that's obviously their prerogative. They can rate them however they want. They can rate any of these guys however they want. But there are so many, I don't want to say prominent, but at least somewhat respectable lists out there where you can compare the numbers. And if there's one outlier, then they're the outlier, regardless of whether they like your guy significantly more than you would want to see or less than you would want to see. Like if Marcelo Meyer is always in the top 25 and then one one ranking system has him at 69, then there's a good chance that that's the ranking system that doesn't have it right. So yeah, just an interesting little note. Uh, bigger news. I guess it's not bigger news, but it's a bigger storyline right now. Is the and we'll 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 touch on both sets of trade rumors, but I'll start with Jaron Duran because I don't know. Robert Murray said that t- he said today that what the Padres and the Sox have been talking, but nothing is close, and that the Sox ask, asking price is high. And John Heyman said today that he also thought the Sox asking price was high, uh, which I think is a good thing. I don't. I don't know. I, I I'll kick it to you. What What do you think? Like, Jaron Duran, do you want to trade him? Asking price high. Like, what What do you think of these reports? So today, I compared the Jaron Duran situation to the Dylan Cease situation with the White Sox. And I know that sounds crazy because they're entirely different players. But what the White Sox are doing is saying, "Hey, we got a guy with multiple years of control. We technically don't have to trade him. We're not in a position where we'll lose him for nothing if we don't trade him. So unless a team is willing to give us you know, above and beyond an offer that you could describe as an overpay, then we're not going to trade him. And that's kind of what I want the Red Sox to do with Jaron Duran. They absolutely don't have to trade him. 
He has what five years of control left. Four he's five, been yeah. he's been very up and down over his major league career. Last year he was very much up. So if if a team isn't willing to pay for that 2023 version of Jaron Duran, just walk away. Otherwise, what's the point? Then you're just trading a guy to trade a guy, which is almost never good. So uh, overpay or nothing. I'm going to put on my tinfoil hat. Oh. I don't think they have any intention of trading Jaron Duran. If they were trying to trade Jaron Duran or thought that they could get a very good, like if this King's ransom thing is legit, why would Cora come out and say Raphael is a center fielder? In what world is a left fielder as valuable as a center fielder? Why would you not market him as a center fielder? This guy's unbelievable. This guy's a stud. Blah, blah, blah. You do it in spring training to build up, to drum up that interest. That was the whole thing with every year we thought that Tanner Houck was going to get traded. They were like, oh, this guy's a great starter. He's going to be so good. In what world is coming out and saying, yeah, Jaron isn't our center fielder, but we want a trade package that is essentially like Louis Robert light. Like a premier center fielder, speedy. Like I'm, I'm not saying Jadran is anywhere close to that. I'm just saying teams are kind of in that market as like a plan B backup consolation prize, whatever. Center field is so much more valuable than left field. Granted Duran's speed will play anywhere. If the bats legit, the back can play lead off can play anywhere. But I don't know why coming out literally the first day of spring training and saying he's not a center fielder, why they would do that if they had any real aspirations of trading Jared Ritter in. It's an interesting point, Pat. That's it because because you're right. We we talked all last season. They, I guess they weren't lying. <laughs> Actually, maybe they were. What did Hauk open the season? Was he a reliever at the start of the year last year? No, he started. No, he started. Yeah. Because I remember last year the whole discourse was. They said Hauk is going to be a starter, and we all thought they're just saying that because they want to keep his value up for a trade. You're, we thought you're that right, this Pat. Year too. Same thing this year, too. After it didn't, I guess you could say it didn't work out last year with him as a starter. I thought it was so so mixed results. Overall but numbers down. were bad, but they said the same thing this year, and we all thought, uh, didn't we think he was going to the Cardinals? I remember us all being like, the Cardinals make sense. He's from there. They need pitching upside. This year? This year or last year? Because last year I remember the whole talk was how can Ha Sung Kim? No, this year, oh, yeah. like super early. Yeah, that too. There was that one too. I just remember there were, I think it was both actually. They might have said the same thing last year, but I'm positive that this year, early, early on in the offseason, in this super exciting offseason, it was there was Hauk to Cardinals rumors because remember they needed three. Oh, starters. true, they did. Yeah, that was the only team that you could argue needs needed starting pitching more than the Red Sox did. So and look That's what they I did. Mean. That was forever yeah. ago. And and like it was like the second they could sign a guy, sign a guy, sign a big guy, and they were good. <laughs> it was crazy. Crazy, right? They had a need and they addressed it. Hmm. <laughs> Pat, I you have you have me thinking because why would Cora not just say that Duran it, I mean like because with the way Cora's talking, you would think they're drumming up Raphael's value. Yes. Because the the talk from Cora is that he's gonna like he this is a guy we believe in as the starting center fielder, and they he's basically talking about him as if he's gonna like Casas take his lumps at the start of the year as a bat and then break out. But I don't think anyone really foresees Rafaela having anything close to the offensive output that Casas did as a rookie. No. But that's sort of how Cora is talking about it. It's like we want this guy in there for his defense. Uh, his bat's going to come along as it will. He's working hard. Uh, Alex Spear had a piece in his art or in his article today. I want to say he was talking about how Raphael's working on his swing decisions, uh, trying to increase the amount of time that it, it takes for him to make that decision so he can make better decisions, which has obviously been his bigger issue yeah. uh, at the plate. But yeah, you'd think with the way they talk, they're talking about him that it would be Raphael's value that they're drumming up. But I don't know. Based on the rumors we've heard this offseason, it sounds like Rafael is not the guy they're trying to trade. It sounds like they're more open to trading Duran. I mean, so like who knows? That, yeah, you could you could just boil it down to like Cora always talks up his guys. But I mean, Pat, you might be onto something. I don't want to say like oh, you're wrong, but I don't know. I think Cora just he talks up his guys, especially the young guys. He likes to give them a little push in the tush. 
Let him know he likes them. They're but good. Sammy, he was asked to follow up though. Like he, it was, I like the he said Rafael was going to be his center fielder if he made the team, and then a reporter asked if he doesn't make the team, it's Duran, right? And he basically didn't didn't say yes. So I thought well, that yeah, was I mean, interesting. If, if you're if your rumor, if there's trade rumors going around about a guy, you probably don't want to see. This is what I do whenever I hear a quote. And there's a response, and the response sounds weird to my ear. I always think, okay, what did I expect him to say? So we expected him to just go, Duran would be the guy if Rafaela. That just kind of, yeah. I feel like that just overcomplicates everything. Like, I don't know. I, don't, I, I would know. expect that. You just I would have fielder last year. It's not a weird thing to say. Exactly. Yeah. It's just it's speaking, speaking with what you had. Of, you're in the middle of trade talks about the guy. You don't want. And then you if don't you want say yes, to know it's Duran. Then it's like you're opening another can of worms. It's like does Cora not think Duran can handle center field? He made improvements last year. Are you saying he can't handle and he's your second choice? It's just, I don't know. That, that that's my issue with all these quotes and trying to take anything away from them. I'm always like, you got to think of what did they say? Why did they say it? Why didn't they say what I think they would have said? To me, it's just like he likes to speak positively about his players. He doesn't want to make Duran Duran who, like we've discussed. He's dealt with mental health stuff. You don't want to like kick a guy like that. You don't want to kick anyone when they're down, but like you don't want to like Duran coming off a good season that ended poorly. You don't want to be like, you're the backup again. So well, I wouldn't I wouldn't say backup. It's just if Rafael doesn't make the team. But this this goes to a point that I that I want to get to. Wouldn't as that well. make him the backup? It, like if this no. guy doesn't make the team, then we're going to you. No, no, because the, the implication would be if Rafaela makes the team, Rafael is in center, Duran's in left. If Rafaela doesn't make the team, Duran's in center and insert who is in left. But this this gets me to a point I wanted to make that why have we not talked a little bit more about potentially Tyler O'Neill getting some reps in center field? Like maybe they think O'Neill in center, if, if Rafaela doesn't make the team, maybe they think O'Neill in center, Duran in left is a better alignment for them than O'Neal and left Duran and center. I think the thing with that is injury risk. He doesn't really play center field. He's only has he not played any left. center? He's played 40 games um, over six seasons, 300 innings. So very, very limited. But at the same what time, years? Do, when, when, do, when, when, when did he, uh, what years did he play? Last year he played 10 uh, 13 games in center. 2022 he played 21. Didn't play for 2021 yeah. or 2020. Yeah, then 3 games in 2023 and 2018. So, yeah, he's not really a center fielder. You also I don't want to rely on a guy on an expiring deal to hold down an imp- an important position like that. You know what I mean? Like I want a guy who that's of such course. an important defensive spot. You really want to plug a guy in and be like, this is our guy. And I would only say that about like shortstop center field and catcher. Catcher is a little different situation because you're very obviously waiting for Kyle Teal to come up. But shortstop, you got a guy locked in who you know is a good defender. Center field, uh, I don't love O'Neal in center. Backup wise, sure. If he has to, fine. But same, same just- with Willier. Willier, like Willier yeah. has played a little bit of it, but like he, I didn't, I didn't love. I mean, I granted, I. It was like a what? How many games did he even play in center in the bigs last year that we saw? I think right. I can. Yeah, did he? He played like one or two, right? It couldn't have yeah, been many. I'll, I'll check right now. By the way, please call him his proper name. It's thick, thick, thick yeah. our thick man, thick Willie. The other thing too, uh, he played that... eighty-five innings in center field, twelve games, eighty-five innings. Yeah, that's more than I thought. You need, you essentially need two center fielders at Fenway. Like yep. you need to have a center fielder in center and a center fielder in right. O'Neal's kind of like that fringe guy who's like a gold glove corner outfielder. He probably handle right field. If he moves to your primary center field, you he, realistically you're probably losing a little bit because he's used to the corner slot going out to center. It's a little bit different. And then you're also replacing essentially center field B with a guy who might not be great defensively. So I think you kind of lose defense in two spots if Tyler O'Neill is your primary center fielder. It's interesting, Pat. Because <laughs> the Red Sox are still so flexible with what they can do with the outfield and how they can approach it if they want to go bat first, if they want to go glove first. If they wanted to go bat first, you kick Rafaela to the minors and maybe you sign an Adam Duvall if you're going to trade a Duran or whatever. And you've got basically no center fielders, but you've got O'Neill out there. You've got 
uh, Duvall out there. Yoshida is going to get innings out there. Maybe Willie or Duran. I don't know, but that's bat first. Like there's no defenders or if they trade Duran and sign Michael A. Taylor, there you go. You've got your two center fielders, one in right, one in center. And you would think that O'Neill, who would presumably be playing left, you're, you would have one of the better defensive outfield alignments in baseball. So I think um, I still think an addition has to has to come in the way of Michael A. Taylor. You can't start Rafaela in the majors after after what I've learned about the service time situation with Rafaela. How irresponsible, especially after the way they've op- they as in the Red Sox have operated recently. How irresponsible would it be to forfeit an entire year of control to have Rafaela start the season in the majors? rather than waiting a month and a half to bring them up. That's insane to me. You have, even if they were spending money, I'd be like, ah, wait a month and a half. Let's get him for an extra year. That's big, man. Especially if he's a trade option, more attractive with another year of control. So um, I, yeah, for me, Rafael is not as much of an option with that knowledge. I just want them to just sign Michael A. Taylor for half a season. Like we spoke about last episode. If they don't, keep Rafaela in the minors until May 16th and they lose a year of control. I would call that sacrificing future wins, which they seem to think is oh. so, so <laughs> incredibly important. <laughs> yeah. I think that's super contra. Uh, like it's just so contradictory. Like we don't want to give up future wins, but we're going to bring up our not good offensive defensive first center fielder and lose a year of control to finish in fifth place. Yeah, and he's got well, to understand how the hell does that make sense? Yeah, Rafael's got to understand that too. It's not a it's not a you're not good enough thing. It's a we want to keep you for a long time. So let's suppress no, more service time. The argument would be different if he was a little bit more of a rookie of the year candidate. Right? Yeah. Cuz then cuz then he could net a draft pick. That's why I didn't have an issue with them handling Costas the way they handled him last year. It's because you never know. And honestly, he felt like he should have gotten more rookie of the year consideration than he did up until the end. Obviously he went down and then it was, then it made the choice kind of obvious, but like he could have been a rookie of the year guy, Rafaela. I don't think they're going to give a rookie. Like if he's an average offensive player and an elite defensive center fielder, he might be the best rookie in the class. And I don't think they would give him the award. So I agree. I, it just, that's like saying, I don't know, like, <laughs> don't spend your money here. You can buy a lottery ticket, and if it hits, you'll make more money. Just it's it's not it's not enough for me to want to risk the extra year of control. Also, it's not like Casas, where there was absolutely nothing left for him to learn in AAA. I know Rafaela had good numbers in AAA, but his big issue is the out of the strike zone chasing. He needs to stop doing that. He's chasing too much still in AAA. Even when his numbers look good, he was still chasing. This is why you can't look at minor league numbers and yes. just be like, he's ready. You have to see how did they get there. And Rafaela, despite the success. High. Is that what? It was high. The chase rate yeah. in the minors. It was, it was like it was it was way too high for a prospect of his caliber. And he yeah. was able to produce despite it, to your point. But yeah. It's like Dahlbeck, like Bobby Dahlbeck. He's 30 homers demolishing baseballs, 30 home runs in triple a. And everyone's saying, why is he not coming up? Look how many home runs he has. Look at his OPS. He's crushing the ball in triple a. Correct. He was also striking out about 35% of the time against lesser pitching. So when he comes up to the majors, what do you think is going to happen? Is he going to keep hitting home runs like that? Or is that 35% strikeout rate going to go above 40? And then you got a guy who cannot hit major league pitching. He's already not giving you much on defense and he's not very fast either. He's not getting on base. That's why Dahlbeck didn't get called up. And that's why Rafaela, if he goes back to triple a, he still has stuff to work on significant stuff. Right. And, and I think that people are obviously higher on Rafaela because elite defender dudes fast. He's going to be a base stealer, even though I'd have to, I'd have to look this up, but I remember the, I remember him getting caught a few too many times in the minors last year, even though he's very fast and stole a lot of bases. Um, but he can provide a lot of value outside of, of his offensive output. So even if he comes up and he is the center fielder, he's going to give you something. It's just that with the lineup, the Red Sox have right now with potentially like a black hole at 
catcher and a lot of question marks in the outfield and even the middle infield, it's tough to have a black hole in center field, which is presumably what he would be at least to start the season at best. Yeah. And that's why if you take the conversation back to our last episode, we talked about Michael A. Taylor, who's, you know, roughly an average hitter at best, maybe a little bit below average, but you know, he's going to give you elite defense in center field. If you could sign that guy for a year, you keep Rafaela down and at least until May 15th, probably a little later, if you're signing Taylor and you flip Taylor, give Rafaela the job, you keep him for an extra year. Everybody wins that way. So yeah, when it comes to Rafael, I'm super, super against him being on the team to start the year. And that is because I like him, not because I dislike him. I'd want him to stay longer. So and that's nice to you, Sammy. You just want you just want him, you just want him to stick around. Very southern yeah. hospitality of you. I appreciate it. I you know me, dude, born and raised in the South. So Southern hospitality is my thing. Steak and potatoes. Oh. Steak and potatoes. Mitch Moreland. Steak and potatoes. I had a steak and potatoes flavored Campbell's chicken noodle soup. It was oh, just, hate what soup. The fuck? Hate soup. Get out of it here. It was like drinking sludge. Yeah, at least you at least you admit that you're drinking when you eat soup. It is it drinking. Drinks like a meal. I love it, that phrase. No, it drinks like a drink because it's liquid. It's soup that eats like a meal. What is that from? That's an ad. Is that Campbell's? Cam- Campbell's Chunky or something? Ring Ring Progresso. Hardy. <laughs> Ugh, this all sounds so bad to me. I hate it. It just all. sounds like a like a big fat bearded southern guy who talks like this. It sounds like it's just his words. Just give me KFC. If you want like, a uh, big fat Elliot. southern guy, just give me KFC, dude. Uh the Colonel. Give me the Colonel. We need a fat southern guy to come on the show just for the vibes. You ever see that I learned how jelly roll? <laughs> <laughs> you, you want me to get Jelly Roll to come on, Pat? I was. Good, I just. I, I learned who Jelly Roll was recently, oh, even though I, I heard his songs. Je- I'm not gonna lie. I, I learned who Jelly Roll was during the Super Bowl. Jelly Roll's the boy. I think I learned who he was specifically during the Grammys, but I'd heard his music and liked his music. I just didn't know who know who it was. He's good. He can. He can sing. Yeah, that's kind of like. That's kind of like me with Taylor Swift, honestly. Like there was a song on the other day and I was like, this isn't bad. The person I was with was like, that's Taylor Swift. And I was like, can really? you sing it? What song? What song? I can't remember. I was at a, I was at a play at the theater and it was Ooh. playing the show. It's pretty good. Should we do some bullpen talk? Bullpen talk. Do some bullpen talk. That with that report, the, uh, I want to say it was McAdam and Chris Smith came out with a report and it like the the Jansen thing was was the first part of the report where uh, they said that the Red Sox are reluctant to trade Jansen unless the team they're sending him to eats the entire salary. But I thought the more notable part of their article was that they are also discussing Chris Martin and John Schreiber in trades. I thought it was interesting mainly because John Schreiber doesn't make that much above league minimum. I want to say this was his first R eligible year. Yeah, yeah. Remember we were talking about Oh, that's how right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He got his yeah. Um Yeah, I don't get it, man. I really don't get the Schreiber one. He's coming off a not his best season where he got hurt. Like you said, doesn't make that much money. One point one mil. Like what are I don't know. And you I, had, I can't uh, even try to understand what the thought process is right now. I think I understand. I think what's going on is they want to get rid of these expiring deals, the bullpen. And then with the rotation, they think Hauk can give them more than like Lorenzen. But the Schreiber thing, why? What's the point? What are you going to get for Schreiber coming off a down year? I'd rather just hope he bounces back. It's my fireman. Like, yeah, like if someone's going to pay for Schreiber the way they would have paid for him if you dealt him at the 2022 deadline, then it's like, okay, like I'll listen to anyone who's going to pay that price for anybody. Duran concept? Same thing? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay. So but, full plus or nothing. But like with Schreiber, I think there's a lot. He was talking about how good he feels. Uh, Bernardino was on the Red Sox social today talking about how excited he is to watch Schreiber this year. He's watching him throw the bullpen. Schreiber was just as nuts in his, pe- in his bullpen sesh as he is on the mound. He was dropping F-bombs 
just like we're used to seeing on the mound. I want to see him bounce back with a healthy season. It was clear he wasn't right from the jump last year, and he made the most of it. And he actually, despite what was going on with his body, was solid. Like, it obviously didn't compare to when he was healthy in 2022, but, like, he was fine. Yeah. Yeah. There's not much to discuss about it. Just, I don't yeah. get it. Yeah. Yeah. Chris uh, Martin. Chris Martin makes sense. That I would totally understand. It's not my yeah. not my preference. My God, that I'm is like that is the sell high guy. Like he yeah. just had a phenomenal season with one year control. You get whatever you can for a guy like that. Yeah. Would you? Okay. Question for you guys, and this is kind of broad. Do you want the Red Sox to sell high on Chris Martin or do you want them to keep him? And let's, for the sake of this question, let's say the return is, you, we go like this. Okay. It's not like a, oh my God. It's a, okay, that's good. They sold high. What would you guys prefer? I would prefer to sell him. I think for me, if they're not going to sign Jordan Montgomery, then there's no reason to wait. Just do it. Okay, so you're keeping him because No, I'm I'm selling him unless Oh, I see what you're saying. You think that you still you still All right, we'll get to the, we'll get to that one next. I will say I I've, I've changed a little bit, but we'll yeah, you feel free to ask. You can keep asking me every episode. I, every, I'm going to keep a, I'm going to keep asking. But yeah, yeah, if they sign Monty, I don't want them trading Martin and signing Monty is I like Chris Martin and a Trading him doesn't free up as much salary as trading Kenley does, but let's uh let's let's get to the money stuff then because right after we finished recording Alex Spear last episode what was it two days ago we finished recording and like thirty minutes later if not even Alex Spear drops an article and in it basically says that even if Jordan Montgomery's market collapses which is I think what a lot of Sox fans have been hoping for Sammy it's what you've been talking about on this podcast and. He basically said if the market, if Monty's market collapses, he wouldn't expect him to go to Boston because it's more likely that he's going to choose to have, what I, I guess, a pillow type contract, probably like a multi-year deal, but with like an opt out after the first year or something like that. But he would expect it to be with more of a contender. So that that obviously sucks. <laughs> that sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here, here's where I'm at. I still do think there's a very good chance the Red Sox sign Montgomery. But getting the Phillies and Dave Dombrowski involved makes me a little less confident in my long-term take that the Red Sox will sign Monty. So I'll still say yes, but my confidence is it's dropped a bit, quite a bit. Pat, did this change how you see it? Uh, we're not getting, we're not getting Montgomery. Like, did you think, did you think they were before this? Did this, did no, this lower your, no. I, I've been pretty like, can, I've come to the conclusion that they're not getting Montgomery. And the, if the reports are true that the Phillies are interested on a two to three year deal, I don't see any world where the Red Sox, how they've been currently operating extend beyond three years. So yeah. if you get a three year offer from the Red Sox or a two year offer from the Phillies, you should go to prison if you pick the Red Sox or the Phillies right now. Agreed. Um, okay, I have a take. If the Red Sox don't sign Monty and Duran trade doesn't happen, I think this is it. I think this is the roster. Those are the, the two things I could see happening. Otherwise, that's it. I don't think they're going to add or subtract anything else. So Yeah, I'm starting to think they may not go and add an outfielder unless a Duran trade comes through. Yeah, no way. I don't, every, everyone keeps saying they're going to add an outfielder. They have seven on the roster right now, right? Or six they, or seven. Either way. Right. They why? needed a three hitter. There's Unless you sign J.D. Martinez, which they're not doing, there's no three hitters left on the free agent market. So, No, if the DH you sign, or the, well, we don't think they're going to sign a DH anymore. But if the DH you had signed was like Soler and he happens to be an outfielder, fine. Yeah. But I feel like the narrative around the fan base is like, they're going to go out and get an outfielder. Half the roster is outfielders right now. What are we talking about? I just don't get that. Yeah, I think, and and obviously, like this comes from Chris Cotillo's report, which happened a couple of days ago. We talked about it, but it was that the Sox are still very much in the market for an outfielder. I I I agree with you, Sammy. I think that is definitely related to 
Jaron Duran trade talks. I think there's a reason that hasn't happened yet. Yeah, but I, th- I don't. Uh, I don't think. Uh, I don't think Chris is like reporting anything like incorrectly. I think he's reporting. No, of what course. He I just don't. I just don't think it's true. Like they're covering their bases for if this stuff happens. Like I don't think teams. It's like the Red Sox are just going to ignore the market they're going to need to be in if this trade that they're trying to make happen happens. But I want to go back to the Monty thing just to, to give my two cents on it because I'm I'm kind of where Pat was. I didn't think Monty to the Red Sox was happening. And this doesn't necessarily change my... like This doesn't lower my belief that much. Like I don't feel that much worse about it than I did because Monty to the Red Sox was not... It was never going to happen on one of those like Carlos Correa to the Twins type deals. That was never going to happen because there are so many teams in baseball that are going to be willing to give Monty a contract like that, if only because he doesn't have the pick attached. And if he pitches for you, he will have the pick attached when he opts out, which way, which would be the hope. The Red Sox are only going to get, get Jordan Montgomery if they end up giving him somewhat close to the value of the contract that he's seeking and no one else is willing to give him beyond a pillow contract. So the market collapsing, like, if the Red Sox are not like the Red the Red Sox were always gonna have to be willing to give him somewhat close to his price. The market collapsing means the Red Sox are not willing to give him his price. And if the Red Sox are not willing to give him close to his price, they're not gonna get him because he's gonna go to a contender. The Red Sox are the collapsed market. If the market collapsed, that just means everyone's coming closer to the Red Sox. Our guys are already below the <laughs> rubble. They have yeah. collapsed already. There is no market here. So uh yeah, I, I trust me. My my feelings about Montgomery coming here are lower, but not zero. I'll ride. I mean, I'm not going to ride with you, Sammy, but I appreciate that you're still riding because I think you got to ride this thing into the ground at this point. Like we're in spring also, training, you gotta you gotta stick with it. Kind of off topic. Blake Snell is still not signed. That's mm-hmm. crazy. And by the way, he's going to go to the Yankees, and it's going to suck. Yeah. Oh, I would hate that. I I. I don't know. I, I had originally predicted the Angels, but after hearing the stuff about Artie Moreno, I mean, he's saying the lower payroll stuff just like the Sox were. So I don't know, man. He's yeah. not one of those. He makes a lot less sense for the pillow contract because I, I it was the same reason I didn't quite understand why the Twins did what they did with Correa. It's like, why why give a one year? Why give what you think is going to be a one year deal to a guy and, and lose a pick? So you're paying full market value for the year and losing a pick just for a year. Like you wouldn't yeah, want to right. give the guy you just took in the first round for for a rental. Like so, why are you doing it in free agency and paying him? Don't know, man. Twins aren't exactly the best team to reflect on as a model franchise, but yeah, it's still it's still odd. Uh, but yeah, it's just this whole this whole free agency is like a master class of things that are wrong with Major League Baseball. Yeah, I mean, well, we'll this will. We'll skip ahead to something because uh, it's kind of related. There was Rob Manfred spoke today, and I know we've got some Manfred uh, takes coming from you guys. But one of the things he said was that the league tried to propose during the CBA negotiations that they have some sort of two week signing period for free agency in December, and they want like a like an NBA style flurry of moves. Like the two weeks is absolutely bonkers. And then that's kind of it for free agency. And they, they didn't get into specifics that I know of about how it would have worked because he said the players union was wholeheartedly against it and just didn't let it get off the ground, which I think sucks. Like I like the players union does a bunch of things that I wish they didn't do, including opposing a salary cap. I get why they do it and I get why they oppose this because you want as free of a market as possible to make the most money. But in terms of what's good for the game, like a free agency window, I think would be a good thing. We'll get to the stuff about about Manfred and his uh his finishing in twenty twenty nine. But before that, just your takes on the uh on a potential free agency window. I love it, but I would do it reversed. I would just start free agency later, like start free agency on January first, and then that's your window. Because if there's a deadline, how do you how do you police that? How do you make it so like oh you can't sign this guy and I know we've discussed we've discussed this before, and there was there was an idea of like any guy you sign for X amount has to be done before this date. I don't love that, 
I think the simplest thing to do is be like, you can't sign until January 1st. And then Pat, to take a page out of your book, just be kind of like gentle with the tampering. Like you don't have to, you don't have to be like the CIA cracking down on every little bit of tampering. Like just wait, wait no signings until January 1st. You still get your rumors. And then boom, January 1st and on, go nuts. It just condenses the window a bit. Maybe, maybe it's avoiding, maybe it's you can sign guys after some sort of because the, the issue, Sammy, is if you start at January 1st, you're still gonna have guys taking into spring training. Like right now, the Boris four are still free agents in spring training, and that would be the case regardless of whether they start free agency at the end of November or if they started at January 1st. But if you had a deadline and said you can't sign multi multi-year contracts after this date. So like guys will still be able to get their big one year, big value for that one year deals if they don't sign before that date. But, but if if they're not signing until, you know, late in spring training, like Trevor story was, I think March 20th, that's mm -hmm. a lot less painful as a fan. If it's like a three month window compared to when did we start this November, November, December, November. January, February, March, that's much longer. So I think that's a good, my idea would be like a starting point to make the baseball offseason more exciting. Because look, look at Pat Brown's face right now. That's how I felt all offseason. Just you're right. The, the NBA yeah. waits a while after the season ends to to do their free agency. It's not crazy length, but baseball it's basically like a few days after the World Series, and it technically starts. And it does make it feel like it drags out that much longer. I don't think there's that much of an appetite for free agency that fast outside of like the lunatics like us. When did Nola sign? Let's see. Hold on. I'm looking this up. He signed Aaron the Nola. same day we interviewed Chris Smith. November 18th or 19th. One of those days. One it's was the announcement. Three months since Aaron Nola signed. Oh, my three God. Months, three months since Nola signed with the Phillies. Now, imagine if he signed January 1st. And we're like, oh, yeah, that was a month ago. Remember that? Yeah. This offseason has been crazy. Look at all these guys with Sonny Gray, Soler, all those things happening. Everything that's happened this offseason, imagine if it was condensed into like a month and a half because it's February 15th. If we started January 1st, this would be the month and a half point. That's an exciting offseason. It's at least more exciting than what we've gotten so far. Yeah, and if you tamper, if you allow tampering, which I'm fully in favor of tampering in that in that window, then tamper. you'd still get storylines like podcasts like us. We'll still have stuff to talk about. Yeah, something like that. I wish I win. Yeah, I wish. It's, it's either crazy. you get you either get a window in the offseason if you're Major League Baseball or nobody cares, which is what's happened so far aside from Otani and Yamamoto. Just, how do you get the players to buy into that? Because they, they are right that any sort of restriction on timing limits your market. It, like it can only limit your market. So how do you sell it? Like you have to sell it on growing the game. But like how much does it actually grow the game? But it how does makes this it... hurt the players? You're still getting three months to negotiate and you can still hold the friggin' owner's feet to the fire going, look, we're getting close, man. I'm going to go elsewhere. If you don't sign me now, I want to have time to do X, Y, and Z. I don't think it's that different for the players. I think if anything, the owners wouldn't like it because that's less time for them to do their weird little shit. I see it as like a reverse Theo hire, like Theo Epstein gets hired and for, for FSG and our initial reaction is like, we don't know what this is, but it can't be a bad thing. It can only be a good thing. I think this for the players, it's like this can only be bad. It can't help us. It can only hurt us. It really depends on the situation. Because if there's less time and like if the well, okay, if there's a player who has a ton of suitors, this helps them. Because then all these teams have less amount of time and they're more inclined to go, ah, oh, fuck it. We're running out of time. Let's offer X amount. But if it's like Lucas Giolito and there's only the Red Sox interested, then the Red Sox could be like, wait all, as long as you want, man. We'll but just Sam, wait it you, But if you if you think your market is going to go like like the first option you said, where teams are like, oh my god, we're getting close, we have to make a whatever offer, then you could just sit out the first couple months anyway. Like all it does is make it so like you can't take a good offer that might be there in November, but now for whatever for one reason or another, maybe some trade, I don't know. Now it's not there in January. I think the only argument you can give is it's good for the game. I wish these. I wish the players and the owners. It's both. It's both these parties. I was saying this way back during the lockout, which was a disgusting time for the game. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was saying this back then that these these parties need to realize that the game is what's important here, 
and you do as well as your game does. So if you yeah, have you something that's good for the game, that. if you have something that's good for the game, you do it. And that's why these rule changes have been good. Like the players didn't like the rule changes, but the game is in a much better place because of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to prove that the game is in a better place to the players, you need empirical evidence. And I think obviously major league baseball, like they poll fans and everything on this. I know very few people, and this is, you know, obviously this is just me talking about my experience. I think the rule changes have been great. And I was super vocal about how much I hated them last off season. Like, Oh, there's going to be more injuries. There's going to be this, that players are going to hate it. I thought it was great. And a lot of people I know who are casual baseball fans, they thought it was great. Um, games are shorter, but still you get a lot of content in them. If you want to call it content, more base stealing speed and defense are more important. Again, the game is getting more athletic. I love that. So, you know, it's, it's, you, you got to show the players that it's not just, hey, you got to grow the game because we love baseball. You got to show them like, look, more viewership, fans like yes. this more. That means more money in your pocket and our pocket. So that's what I would. It's, it's my long winded. No, I agree. Like, there's got to be a way to show the players that this helps them. I agree. The issue, I think the one issue is that so many players careers are so short and owners don't own these teams forever that they care so much about short-term gain as opposed to the long-term growth of the sport, which sucks. I don't know. I, I I still think that even in the short term, like you saw how well the game did last year, just one year. With one year of these rule changes, the game did so well. It's like if you do what's good for the game, you never know how much it can grow. Uh, but the other thing that was on the docket with Manfred is that he said he's done early 2020, 2029. So before the 2029 season starts, it looks like we'll be uh, in the market for a new commissioner of baseball. Theo? Uh, yeah, that's where my head went. <laughs> if there's, it's Theo's either doing an expansion team or he's the commish, one or the yeah. other. But yeah, do you guys remember? Uh, do you curious? I, I forget if I've talked with you guys about this. I don't think we, I've talked about it on the show. If I have talked about it with you guys, do you remember who the runner-up? To Rob Manfred was to be commissioner when he first John Henry, close was not John Tom Henry. Warner. Yeah, it was Tom Warner. Wait, I thought it was George Bush. <laughs> hey, Coop. <laughs> Wait, no, that's like a legitimate thing. George Bush was supposed to be like I think that was way before baseball. That oh, was okay. that might have been with Bud Selig. I think you. Right. I think you're right, Coop. I think that was a thing. I think George Bush, because he owned the Rangers and then I want to say had to sell because he was running for president. He Once he became president, he had to sell the Rangers. Right. But, but yeah. yeah, the recent time it was, it was Tom Warner or Rob Manfred, which very interesting. I'm, I, yeah, I, I think Theo would be a good candidate to replace Manfred. I don't know. I, I know Sammy has an opinion on this. Why do you think Theo would be a good candidate? Because I think Theo cares about the game. Yeah. I think Theo is one of, in terms of ownership guys around the league who aren't players or like hands on or like former players, I think Theo by far is one of the more in touch people in the entire baseball world. And I think that's exactly what baseball needs is a guy who g actually likes the game of baseball. So we're so, okay. That's implying that Rob Manfred doesn't like baseball, right? He doesn't because of the trophy comment because the trophy comment. Yeah. I just think I think with Manfred, he's just he I don't know. I, I don't think he doesn't like baseball. I just think that he is so deep into this shit that it's like the, the too close to the forest to see the trees thing. Too close yeah, to the trees yeah. to see the forest. Yeah, yeah. Some, something I, like that. I also think that Theo is that super, super rare hybrid that is like loved and respected by owners and players. Like, I think that's a very, very rare combination. Like, guys like Manford, like these suits, these guys who are businessmen and go from owner to blah. Like, I mean, players don't know them. Like, players don't give a shit. Okay, here, here's my here's my negative comment. It's not his job to be, like, buddies with everyone. Like, I that's not that. – that doesn't get business done. I sound like such a jerk, but it's true. No, you're you're right, Sammy. His, his job is to be basically – the Scott Boris for the owners. He's the agent for the owners, which yeah, I feel is not like, what it should be. That's not what look, the job should entail. Like the job should be doing 
what is best for the game and mending fences, like being the the line of communication between both sides. Like you should exactly. be that was doing what's, yeah, you should be doing what's good for the game, but also understanding what needs to be done to do what's right by the people who own the product. But unfortunately, like, even if it's Theo, it ta- you have to do, you have to implement policies and rules that owners are going to approve. I think what, what See, level of approval do you need to get? Is it like twenty four of the of the thirty owners need to approve something to get approved? It's something crazy, yeah. yeah it's, it's high. high. But but see, th- this is what I don't fully agree with. I think the commissioner's job is to put as much money as possible in the players and owners' pockets. Just because owners. It's, it's it's the United States. It's a capitalistic society. That's what we do. Right. That's, but that's the problem. Works. Here's the thing, though. It the is problem, but there's no. It's not going to change. Right. What I'm saying. I the agree. Thing is, the owners are the commissioner's boss. So kind of through chain of command, he's going to be partisan to the owners, which, I mean, approving a commissioner, that's not going to change, whatever. But I don't know if you guys remember this, but during the lockout negotiations, after every single meeting, Manfred made a very, very bad habit of going out to the press and just shitting on the players' union. (laughs) You can't be doing that as someone who's supposed to be kind of this mediator, this in terms of both parties, this is what's good. Like there's no, he's not afraid to show where his allegiance lies, I guess. That's a good and point. I, I necessarily because, blame him because the, it, like the owners are his boss. So like, I understand mm-hmm. that notion at the same time, throwing the other party under the bus is a bad look. I agree, Pat, because you make a great point. If he's able to bridge that gap, that's conducive to more business. Yes. And that's how things get done. So, you know, fair point you make. I know Manfred, I don't hate Manfred, but I will, I'm not disillusioned enough to say that he's perfect. He's not. He made that stupid comment about what do you call the World Series trophy? A hunk of metal metal. or hunk of metal. (laughs) Insane. And I know like people don't like him because he's not very good on the mic. (laughs) Try being Red Sox fans, people. And uh, yeah, so not perfect, but overall, like I don't get the widespread hate. Well, I do. People in power are hated. Generally, I'm kind of like agreeing with that mindset. But I think he's done a fine job. Do we all agree that the rule changes have been a success and made the game better? Yes, but that's it. That's yes. the one thing that I think they he slash they did right. Question for both of you guys. Just quick. What, what league right now would you say is more popular? Major League Baseball or the NBA? NBA. It's not even it's not even close. Right. It's not even you're right. It's not even close. Why I okay, I, I'm not even gonna ask. I'm just gonna say the, the primary reason that I think the NBA is in a better spot as a league is its ability to create headlines, its ability to dominate the calendar year round because of how exciting their offseason is. In season trades are crazy. And why why does all of this why is it so crazy? It's because they have a salary cap and they suppress the value of these players' contracts. So players, basic, it makes it so players have to pick their teams based off of factors outside of money. Whereas baseball, it's they're going to go even to the worst. Like a pitcher will go to Colorado and pitch for the Rockies if they pay him enough money. Mike Hampton. <laughs> right. Mike Hampton, dude. Mike Hampton. Yeah, he great. made a bunch of money off them. Gordo, he, so, so my thoughts on the NBA, two things. It's like the perfect storm almost. They have a sport where the roster is much smaller than the other sports they're competing with, uh, baseball, hockey, and football. They're also competing with UFC, but that's a whole different conversation. Also, with those small rosters, it allows the NBA to market their star players like they're superheroes because there's no sport where one player can have an impact like LeBron James or Jason Tatum. The only thing that I would say is close is football, and that's only the quarterback. So when you have a sport where one guy makes all the difference in the world and you can have this player come in, like what's a good – like Jimmy Butler goes to Miami. He's like the savior. All of a sudden, they're a contender. Look at that. You got Jimmy Butler. You're in the mix to win the NBA Finals. Stuff like that. And they're just so good at marketing these guys and making them larger than life, whereas in baseball, we're like – 
you know, this utility player offers great value. If the Red Sox flip this big name player and get him in the, you know, prospect, blah, 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 blah. It's just so much between the margins. And this is all without discussing. But that's, that's, you, said, you can't like, change that. You can't yeah. change. That's not something that baseball can emulate just because it's a different game. But what you can emulate, basically, if you have a salary cap and max salaries per player, the NBA allows guys to go to free agency after four years. Baseball, you have to wait six. Like, Base, there's just the issue is that the players have been so against having a salary cap. I don't, I don't think they would take anything close to that. Like I would, I think that having players go to free agency quicker is good for the game because fans can have hope. Like there's a hope that your team can get Victor Wembanyama and he's a rookie. It makes it tougher to market though. If you have guys moving around all the time and they're not like superstars. I don't know. It, it's really tough with baseball. The way that the sport is structured and the speed of the game, it's it's not easy, man. Like, I thought the best thing baseball did was the let the kids play campaign where they showed the swag and the like, yes. guys like Tatis. You need a bunch of guys like Tatis or like Marcus Stroman if he wasn't a scumbag. Shit like that. Like, you need <laughs> more you need more personalities in the game. The worst thing, the worst thing to happen to baseball is the old head rules of the game you gotta follow the unwritten rules fuck that dude that is the worst way to grow the game it'll never happen so i i, I just think of marketing shift or a shift back to the let the kids play thing i thought that was really good but but then again if they're no longer doing it does that mean it didn't work so i don't know there's a lot of things to think about i just don't think that comparing to the other leagues helps because you're gonna feel bad i might stand alone in this i don't want a salary cap like at all. Really? I don't. Uh, because I don't think that teams should be on an even playing field. I think that the teams that are have these massive fan bases, I think the teams that may generate all of this money have the rich like I think there should you should be at an advantage if you have an owner who gives a shit. You should be an owner or you should have an advantage if your fan base shows out. You shouldn't have to the Red Sox, the Yankees, the Dodgers should not operate like the Colorado Rockies in Oakland Athletics. Okay, all right. Counter argument. There's no sport in which the owners matter more than baseball. And I exactly. hate that. I don't want to be thinking I about love John Hen I don't want my I don't want my team's success dictated by this crypt keeper that owns them and like it's just so we talk about ownership so much and I don't I hate it. I don't like talk even when they're good. I still I don't want to be thinking about the owners. I've been in so much mental gymnastics just in the last few weeks just to separate the players and rooting for the players from the owners because, like, I don't want to give the owners credit if this team does well, miraculously. They don't deserve it. So it's like, I don't know, just take the owners out of the picture as much as possible. That's how I look at it. I hear your argument. As a Red Sox fan, historically, I've liked this because it's been it's behooved us. But damn, man, I, yeah, I, I don't want to think about the owners any more than I already have to. All right. We got to get to some enough set before we jump off here. Uh, get a kick to one of you guys. Who, who wants the first one? I can go first. Pat, Pat, you want it? You got it. Coop, you got it? Uh-oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> Look at this shit, Gordo. Yeah. It's coming. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. Oh! oh my god. Okay, so for for the listeners, you might want to go to you, YouTube for this one because this Philadelphia Phillies jersey. Oh my god. You know what it looks like? You remember those uh those energy drinks, Sobe with the lizards on the sides that yes. everyone used to. Yes. So how do you pronounce that? It looks like an ad. It looks like they collaborated with that energy drink company. Dude, they are so bad. That might be the worst Major League Baseball jersey I have ever seen in my life. I, and there's I, it's like, I don't think that's a crazy thing to say. It's like Wait, they clicked true. random. It's like they clicked to randomize the jerseys and said, okay, well, we've got main blue with a side of yellow. And we're, okay, we got to do it. Do you guys know the backstory behind like how this leaked? No. No. They like fell off the back of a truck. <laughs> parentheses, parentheses on that and they just like wound up in philadelphia 
and someone put it, I think it was like two weeks ago, someone had put it out and it's just like, I think it was a trial balloon by Philadelphia to be like, I wonder if people like this, but there has, there's no way that these are going to be used. That's bananas. No, that this is legitimately like the exact Jersey that when I used to play like MLB, the show and create my own, like, yeah, franchise, I made like the bean town bombers. Like this, is the kind of shit I'd make this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's the worst. That is the worst major league baseball Jersey I've ever seen in my life. I'm trying to think if there's like, I thought the Dodgers city connects were awful. The all blue pants and everything. They look like Smurfs, but like, this is completely different. And we don't even – do they have matching pants or are they just going regular baseball pants with this? They're, they have green pants. What? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, oh, God. Man. Okay. Dude. <laughs> but, like, it was so I'm believable. Like, like the Nats last year with the, the cherry blossom, that was a little bit insane. But, like, it looked kind of cool. It's going away. This, this is just stupid. Oh, you've offended Cooper. As a former D.C. resident – I love the cherry blossoms. Those cherry, were oh yeah, they're, they're, they're all right. I mean, the hats like were better them. than the jerseys themselves, but great job by the hats on that. Fair, fair, fair. Yeah, I just don't. The Padres I, I get brown and piss yellows. Mm. Um, all right, my my enough said. Uh, really quick, uh, Corey Kluber is a sleeper agent for the Yankees. Did you guys see that he's in talks to become one of their pitching development coaches? So oh now we know. <laughs> Why he fell off a cliff last year. He's trying to help his future employer, the Yankees. That's it. That man is yeah. the bane of my existence. <laughs> Great career. All right. Uh, that would suck. That would be whatever. I mean, what? I don't know. I have, I have no reaction to that. Corey freaking Kluber. But mine, my final enough said, do you guys, have you guys ever been on, on the streets in Boston and this dude goes up to you? And starts freestyle rapping about you. Dude, wait, 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 wait. No. Are you talking about Black Swan? That's my enough said is about Black Swan, yeah. Uh, hold on one sec. I'll be right back. If this if this guy, if Sammy is, is about to show us that he bought one of Black Swan CDs, I'll just, if you don't know who Black Swan is, you'll be just on the streets. Of, Pat, Pat, do you not know who this guy is? I don't know. Okay, so basically you'll be, oh my God. Sammy has a shirt. I didn't even know there I were shirts. To, I went to a, a Bruins game last year, and I was with my friend Patrick, who grew up in Vienna, Austria. And it was his like, only like second or third time at the Garden. And we see Black Swan from a distance, and I was like, bro, we, you, oh, check this guy out. This is Black Swan. I've How many times have him. you run into him, Sammy? Oh, I'm not exactly. I've run into him. 30, maybe more, because he used what? to hang out. On the common, and I went to Suffolk, so I'd have to cross the common to get to class. Oh, all the time I'd run into him, and I'd go, "Oh, Swan!" And he'd do his his handshake, the boom boom, and he called my friend Patrick the Austrian Swan. <laughs> so he'd go, "I am B Swan." <laughs> yeah, B Swan. But, hold on, I, I gotta the... get the context. This guy basically just hangs out on the streets of Boston, and like he'll go up to you and just start freestyle rapping about you, and it's actually ridiculously impressive because. There's no way he could have come up with any of this stuff before he does it. And he just goes to town and the, the, it all rhymes and it all has everything to do with who you are, what you look like, what you're wearing. It's wild. And I've, I've run into him three times and it's bananas. The, the reason he, he uh, popped into my head was because, A, so I followed him on Instagram like two months ago. He followed me back like a few days ago. I was like, oh, my God, Black Swan followed me on Instagram. Uh but he also, I don't know. I can't quite understand it. Sam, you'll have to go and look at his Instagram. He announced like, is he like leaving Boston or something? I don't know. I'm, oh, I'm no. nervous that he's leaving Boston. You're going to, we'll, ha we'll have to touch up on this on a future episode and give a black swan update. But I think he might be leaving the city. He might be going to New York or something. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, if he's going to New York to pursue a career, that's great. Cause he's legitimately talented. Genghis yeah. Swan. Yeah. That's, I got the Genghis Swan shirt. I thought that was cool, but you know who he always name drops in his songs and uh, trust me i've run into him a million times so i've heard it a million times papelbon really yes he always says river dance like papelbon at the end of his songs like not always but a lot of the time he'll say that <laughs> oh okay yeah we've got we've got the post up it's very, very long 
Dude, he I yeah. can le- that that legit makes yeah, me see, like emotional. I'm so happy for him, man. If he's actually doing new year, something new village. like New yeah. Year New Village. He's basically saying follow your dreams and don't get don't get uh held down by anyone. But Dude, New Year yes. New Village. I don't know what that means, but I, I I hope I hope he's doing good. I hope he's got a cool opportunity wherever he's going because that guy's awesome. The nicest guy in the world too. Like he's always yeah. friendly. He's 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 not in your face about it. He's super cool. I, I wish that dude nothing but the best. Big Black Swan fan. Yeah, I am B Swan. If, if you've run into him, you know. And if you haven't run into him, I hope you do. But on the, <laughs> I'm glad we get to finish with Black Swan. <laughs> he's the best. On that <laughs> note, though, <laughs> this has been episode 40. I cannot believe. We've done 40 episodes of these since the Red Sox have thrown a single pitch in game action of any kind. But this has been episode 40 of Play Tessie. Uh, Before you log off, before you click onto something else, just remember, hit that subscribe button, hit that follow button. Whether you're listening on Apple, Spotify, Odyssey app, any of those, just click that follow button, get those notifications when we drop episodes, rate us five stars while you're there. And also check us out on YouTube. Uh, If you're on YouTube, give us that thumbs up. Hit that follow button. Hit that subscribe button for that WEI page. That's where we post all of our episodes. Uh, it's really cool. We got cool graphics coming. Like, we got the play Tessie border. You get to see all our pretty faces. Pat Brown will flex for you every now and then. Uh, but yeah, appreciate you guys tuning in. This has been episode 40 for Play Tessie. Thanks for tuning in. Toodaloo.